Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Tonight is our last, the third, in our Courageous Leader series of speakers, and I couldn't be more honored and delighted to introduce tonight's guest. Miss Amber Smith flew into enemy fire in some of the most dangerous combat zones in the world. One of only a few women to have flown the Kiowa Warrior helicopter, whose mission is armed reconnaissance, required its pilots to stay low, fast, and perilously close to the fight. Amber deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan as a member of the elite 217 Cavalry Regiment out front, part of the legendary 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles, where she rose to be pilot in command and an air mission commander. She is a fourth generation military family member. She is also author of the best-selling Danger Close and a former deputy assistant to the Secretary of Defense. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Miss Amber Smith. helicopter into some of the most dangerous and unforgiving combat zones in the world, including Iraq and Afghanistan. I've even got the AK-47 round that I got to keep after it landed about 12 inches behind my back during um, when our helicopter got ambushed in Iraq. But my journey started long before the military. I grew up on the West Coast in Washington State on a very rural alfalfa and timber farm in the middle of nowhere. I was your quintessential tomboy. I grew up riding four-wheelers and shooting guns and flipping hay bales and helping pick up sticks off my dad's grass airstrip that he used to fly his L-19 bird dog, which is a Vietnam uh, plane, airplane. And I had this very early exposure to aviation and I absolutely loved the challenge of it. I loved the adventurous nature of it, and I even loved the danger of it. So I was definitely a wild child, but I, oh, no problem. Uh, but you could say that aviation is in my blood. My great-grandfather was in the military. He uh, was a lieutenant in the army and served in the Battle of Verdun. My grandfather was in the Army Air Corps, and he flew in World War II on the aerial routes between Northern Africa and into Europe and went on to fly for some uh, helicopter prototypes. My dad was in the 82nd Airborne as a paratrooper, and then my mom in the 1960s, she was a civilian pilot as well. She had her ratings all the way up to CFII, which is a civilian flight instructor, and it was very rare for women to be in the, uh, flying in those positions back then. So I just grew up thinking that that exposure to aviation was normal, sitting around the dinner table with your family and your dad explaining to you how to recover from a stall, or that airspeed was the most important word in the English language. But I sort of focused my energy uh, on competitive gymnastics. I went on to be the Oregon State Gymnastics Champion. And from there, I took the normal, most normal route that people do out of high school. I, I went to University of Washington and I put my gymnastics skills uh, to work and I became a college cheerleader for the Huskies at University of Washington. Um, but Seattle was the big city to me. I graduated with 92 people from high school and uh, it was, my closest neighbor was about half a mile away from me. So it was quite a culture shock. Uh, but I was never one of those kids that had life figured out, that from a young age knew the path and career that I wanted to pursue and what strategy I was gonna need to have to get there. Um, in fact, it was the exact opposite. I had no clue what I wanted to do. Um, but when I was at the University of Washington, I 
took an elective class in aviation, and it was the only class that I got an A in. Uh, but then something happened, and it changed the trajectory of my life forever. Uh, I, sorry, let me see. Okay, we'll see if we can get the slideshow going. Uh, so. I uh, was asleep in my basement apartment in college, and I heard my roommate coming down the stairs. It was still dark out. It was way too early to be waking up a college student. And she handed me the phone, and she was like, your mom's on the phone. And I'll never forget um, this. All right, I'll never forget the sound of my mom's voice. She was like, get in front of a TV, we're under attack. I ran in front of a TV with my roommates and we watched uh, the events of 9-11 unfold. And they say the two most important days of your life are the day that you're born and the day that you figure out why. For me, in that instant, it suddenly became crystal clear for me. It was like a light switch. Um, watching the United States get attacked, watching the towers fall, really woke me up and made me realize I wanted to serve my country. I felt the best way that I could do that was by using my aviation experience um, and become a pilot. Um, the like Watching the attack sort of reignited my passion and love for aviation that I had grown up with. and. I went very quickly from having zero clue in terms of my path and where I wanted to go to saying, all right, I want to serve my country and I want to fly. So I started doing extensive research uh, on the military and the different branches that I could serve in. And I went and talked to every single military branch. And every single one of them told me the exact same thing except one. They were like, oh, you want to become a military pilot, good for you. Go finish school and then come talk to us. Uh, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go fly now. So it turns out the one that I was the most reluctant to go talk to, which was the Army, uh, ended up having a program that was absolutely perfect for me. Uh, and I could finish college while I was in the military. Um, I had already made up my mind. I didn't want to stay and finish the college route. Uh, but there was only one very significant catch. And that was that you had to become a helicopter pilot and not a fixed wing pilot. And fixed wing was how I grew up. It was what my family flew, what I had experience in. Um, and it was what I thought I wanted to do. Um, I was a little bit apprehensive about pursuing that route because I wasn't sure if I hated helicopters. I was gonna commit you know, almost eight years of my life. Um, and plus I grew up with my dad telling me that helicopter pilots are crazy. So this describes it best. Um, there are a million parts rotating rapidly around an oil leak, all waiting for metal fatigue to set in. And if you've ever flown a helicopter, you know that there is definitely some truth to that. Uh, but I didn't let that deter my ambition. Um, I focused a lot of my efforts on researching helicopters, but I figured the best thing that I could do was to actually go fly. And I went and I met my parents at an air show in Olympia, Washington, and I was an absolutely broke college student at the time. I had no money, and they were giving these R22 Robinson helicopter rides. It was $60 for 20 minutes. And I begged my, pilot, uh, my parents to pay $60 so I could go on this 20-minute flight, and they agreed. And I still tell them to this day that's the best $60 they have ever spent on me uh, because 
after that moment, I landed after that 20 minutes and I could not stop smiling and I knew that helicopters were for me and that's what I wanted to do. But I had to do a couple of things before I uh, got to flight school. I ended up studying and taking all the tests and doing all the interviews and ultimately got selected for Army flight school um, starting in 2003. But first I had to go to boot camp where I got one of the biggest shocks uh, of my life. You pull up on a bus and you're all in civilian clothes and there's all this nervous chatter going on on the bus and you pull on base and it's straight up out of a movie where the entire length of the building is drill instructors with their Smokey the Bear hats on and um, you know, big flexed muscles and as soon as the bus screeches to a halt, there's like went from nervous chatter to pure silence and the drill instructors are on the bus um, in the blink of an eye, two inches from your face and screaming at you that you have about you know, 10 seconds to get off the bus and into formation. And that was all I needed uh, to get off the bus and into formation. Uh, that was the beginning of my journey of pushing myself outside of my comfort zone and discovering what I was truly capable of. You don't learn when you stay in the comfort of your own bubble of everything that you know and are used to and good at. Uh, it's very comfortable and cozy, but it's also extremely uh, deceiving because there is so much waiting for you past that comfort zone. Um, but then once you take the risk, two steps out of that, um, that is when your learning begins. So I started flight school uh, that summer, just after the Iraq war kicked off. Uh, and it ended up being about a year and a half of studying, flying, um, learning airspace, limitations, emergency procedures, uh, learning every single inch piece and part of the aircraft and how absolutely everything functioned in the aircraft. Uh, I also went on to do SEER school or survival school and then also Dunker water, uh, water survival training as well. So I was lucky enough to get selected to fly the Kiowa Warrior helicopter. Uh, it's a light attack reconnaissance platform. It carries a 50 cal machine gun. It carries a rocket pod. We can carry uh, between seven and 14 high explosive rockets depending upon how it's configured as well as Hellfire missiles. It only has two seats. It's got one for the pilot, one for the co-pilot. And uh, what makes the Kiowa so special and unique is its mission. We provide direct support for ground forces. So the infantry, NATO forces, special forces, Marines, in-country partners like the Iraq army or the Afghan uh, Army, you name it, we have definitely worked with them. So we provide aerial security. We hunt for improvised explosive devices or IEDs or roadside bombs. Uh, we provide real-time actionable intelligence. And then we're able to find, fix, and destroy the enemy. No two days are alike uh, as a Kiowa pilot. One day we may be scouting for the enemy in the mountains of Afghanistan. Um, we may be searching for roadside bombs ahead of a convoy or observing artillery fire. Um, we also work with close air support with the Air Force, the Navy, uh, or we may get called in to escort a medevac that's carrying wounded soldiers. Uh, we may get called into an ongoing enemy firefight um, to take out an enemy target. Uh, that is a frequent in the job of being a Kiowa pilot. But we do this all at extremely low level. Well within eyesight of uh, the enemy and well within range of their weapon systems. Um, we're talking a couple hundred feet off of the ground, um, which comes with all sorts of hazards in addition to enemy threats. Um, we prided ourselves on being able to respond to a call from gra ground forces um, in minutes in, with nothing but a call sign, a frequency, and um, a grid to get to where we were going. So 
the Kiowa definitely breeds a different type of pilot because of that mission. It was one of the most sought after helicopters in flight school, um, and it had very few slots available per class, which made it very competitive. Uh, but I didn't uh, necessarily start. Uh, I ended up getting selected to fly Blackhawks initially. And I went into, which I was a little upset with, but I got over it and I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love the Blackhawk. And I went to my first day of ground school and I walked in and I sat down and the door closed and the instructor got started and then uh, the door opened, there was a knock on the door and it opened and this second lieutenant walks in and walks up to the instructor and they're talking and uh, the instructor looks up and he's like, Miss Smith? And I had not been in the army for very long but I knew that when you're singled out like that, it probably wasn't a good thing. And I was like, this is my first day of ground school, what did I do, how am I already getting in trouble? And he's like, go with this lieutenant. So I walk, grab my backpack, I walk out the door, and the lieutenant is like, Miss Smith, you're not gonna be a Blackhawk pilot, you're gonna be a Kiowa pilot. So I was one slot on first selection, like I missed the Kiowa selection slot by one seat, and then it turns out that uh, someone had a medical emergency and I was able to get bumped up into uh, the Kiowa slot. So I always say it was uh, fate that I ended up getting to fly the best aircraft in the Army's inventory. Uh, so I had just graduated from flight school. I was very excited to sort of put the training side behind me and walk into my new unit as a helicopter pilot um, as my first real Army job. I naively assumed that it was going to be a fairly nine to five job. Like every recent flight school grad, I thought I was this awesome pilot, I was ready to take on the world, join the unit. Little did I know that flight school was basically just to make sure you could fly the aircraft well enough to not crash it into the ground. When you got to your unit, that is when the real learning began. Uh, that's when you start preparing for war and that's when you truly learn your mission. When I got to my unit, I quickly realized what was at stake. I was terrified of failing, of doing a maneuver wrong, of appearing weak, of not being taken seriously. And for good reason, I was a 22-year-old woman in a unit that had only seen very few female pilots. Uh, to say they were still very rare at that time. So to say that I was different was an understatement. And some people just didn't like that. Um, I knew I was getting judged and tested every single day. Some people there were just waiting for me to stumble, waiting for me to fail, for, for me to prove them right, um, about me not being able to cut it. And I knew I had to focus and show them that I was there for the long run. Um, that I was there to be a part of the team, to accomplish the mission just like they were. And I quickly realized that I had two choices. I could allow my fear of failure to either be my best friend or my worst enemy. And I decided to make that fear of failure work for me. I used it as motivation to drive me forward uh, in those moments of doubt, I would regroup, I would readjust, and refocus, and then I would keep going. If I did fail, um, I had those moments of pure doubt um, where I stumbled and I did fail um, more times than I can count, but I didn't dwell on it. I didn't make excuses, I made changes. Those are the moments that make you mentally strong, being able to push your boundaries and push through those hard times and keep going. It makes you a better pilot, it makes you a better leader, and it sends a message to the entire team that you're trustworthy and people can count on you when things are difficult because things will be difficult. But that's how you grow. It's how you grow as a leader, it's how you grow as a military officer and as a leader. So if you've ever seen the show on HBO, Band of Brothers, it came out a while ago. Um, 
it was about the 101st Airborne Division, Screaming Eagles at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. This was my first duty station straight out of flight school. It's a very historic and heroic, legendary unit in the Army. It was established uh, in World War II. It's been essential in almost every war or conflict since then. And it's something that I am incredibly proud of uh, to have gotten to war the Screaming Eagle patch on both my left and my right shoulder and be a part of that legacy. So this right here, this became my band of brothers and sisters. This was my flight troop, Alpha Troop 217 Cav, um, taken right before we headed into Iraq in 2005. Um, this group of people right here, um, over the years, I will have had some of the craziest experiences of my life with some of these people. In combat, you definitely develop a unique relationship um, with those you serve with, with those who are on your team. It's almost a family, and that includes the good, the bad, the ugly, um, the fun times, the sad times. Um, but we were a team, and we had a mission to accomplish. And it took every single one of us to do so. So I was 23 years old when I deployed to the Middle East um, for a year in 2005. Uh, I was flying this multi-million dollar helicopter in Iraq. I was responsible for making life and death, death decisions um, in a very short amount of time. And in combat, though, you learn very quickly that it's not just about being a good pilot. It's about being a good decision maker and a good communicator when the pressure's on. In aviation, you live in a world, in combat, you live in a world that is constantly changing. You've got the situation on the air. You've got the situation on the ground, the friendly, the enemy situation. Um, everything in the cockpit, it can all change in a second. And you have to be able to adapt and make those very tough decisions in an instant. And as the commander of an aircraft, as a commander of any force, it's ultimately up to you to make those very tough decisions. There's not a lot of room for error. This is real world combat. The real bullets flying through the air, real bombs blowing up on the road. And there's real guys on the ground that us as Kiowa pilots were there to help protect. So teams are everything in combat. If you're not carrying your weight, if you're having a bad day, it affects the entire team. And there's not much time or room for that in combat. It's more than just showing up to do the job. You have to work hard, otherwise you're dead weight somebody else is picking up that weight for you. In aviation, you often see in the movies the stories about the pilots. Um, but we have this fantastic support system that allows pi pilots to be able to do their jobs. Um, you've got flight operations, planners, maintainers, logistics, fuelers, air traffic controllers, and then the ground forces as well that we know we can count on if our aircraft goes down for maintenance, for enemy fire, whatever. We're able to count on that entire uh, unit because everybody is absolutely essential to mission success. So it's easy to narrow your mind um, in the moment and think about it's just me up here, it's just um, you know whatever your specific track happens to be, but you're not gonna do it alone. You're not going to be successful without um, pulling all of those crucial pieces of the puzzle together. Um, and understanding that if something becomes stagnant, if, if one of those puzzle pieces stops working properly, it's going to affect the entire group. It stresses the entire team. Everybody feels it, which is why a hardworking uh, team mindset is absolutely essential when the stakes are incredibly high. So Iraq was a year of drinking from a fire hose for me. It tested me mentally, physically, emotionally. Every single day was its own challenge. I actually had a printed out picture of this photo that my dad had given me and I taped it uh, to my locker. And it was constant visual motivation that I needed. There were missions that were incredibly tough that we thought 
that we weren't going to make it back from, when the people that we worked with were killed, when teammates were shot, um, when we had extremely close calls that to this day you're still surprised that you're here. Every time I walked out the door to head to a mission, I would tap on this picture as a reminder and no matter how things got, no matter how terrible they were in the moment, that I would never give up. And it was a promise that I made to myself and it was the motivation that I needed during those hard times to reset your perspective. As soon as we got home from that year-long Iraq deployment, uh, we started preparing for our next mission, which was Afghanistan. Uh, we deployed uh, January of 2008, and suddenly I went from uh, being this very new pilot, uh, pilot in command um, with almost no experience, to being this combat veteran, um, air mission commander with a, an entire war under my belt. But this war came with many more responsibilities um, because of those positions. The war was different. Um, this enemy was different, very willing to fight, even um, they weren't as intimidated by helicopters. Um, the hazards, the terrains were very different. Uh, even power management and how we physically had to fly the aircraft was different. Um, but the thing that I absolutely love about aviation is that you learn something new every single day. It's never the same, you never get bored, it's all hands-on learning. There is absolutely no substitute for the experience that you gain um, while you're out there on those combat missions. Um, but you're confronted with, like I said, new hazards, new missions, different weather, a new co-pilot, possibly someone straight out of flight school that thinks they know absolutely everything about aviation, just like I did. Uh, all of those new exposures give you opportunities to learn, to make decisions, uh, to learn from those decisions, to grow, to get out of your comfort zone as a pilot, as an individual and as a leader. When you get comfortable, you get complacent. Complacency kills in aviation and it definitely kills in combat. Towards the very end of a very long year in Afghanistan, I had the night off. Usually when you switch from the day shift to the night shift, they give you a day or two um, to sort of make that shift. So I was on my day off and I got this knock at my bee hut door, which is a plywood, very thin, wood um, little shack that you live in, at least we lived in. Um, and one of the pilots came in and was like, hey, Amber, I need to talk to you. And I was a bit surprised, it was my day off, and he was like, hey, I know you're not on the flight schedule tomorrow night, but I just added you and you have to fly tomorrow night. Like I said, um, I wasn't on the flight schedule, so I gave him a little bit of pushback, and he's like, I'm not gonna tell you anything else other than you'll be happy you got put on the flight schedule. So that was enough for me to say, okay, um, that's fine with me, show up. <laughs> and so I, the next day I get on the bus to go around the airfield to go over to our CP or hangars and the other flight crew is there and we all have the same look in our eyes like what is going on, why are, why are we here and why is nobody telling us what's going on. So the, uh, the pilot walks in and he's like, hey, I wanted to tell you guys earlier, but um, Secret Service threatened my life if I told you guys prior to this very moment. So we were selected to fly as an armed Kiowa team to fly uh, aerial security for the President of the United States. Um, we were the only, they closed down the entire airspace. Um, we were the only flight crew that knew what was going on. We were armed and you know, the mission was to take out any threat posed to Air Force One. So the plane was already in the air, headed our way. Um, we knew President Bush had been in Iraq and it actually made global news because uh, an Iraqi journalist had taken a shoe and thrown it at him, if anybody's familiar with that story. So what we didn't know is that he had a secret follow-on mission into Afghanistan 
to go meet with the then President Karzai. Um, so in the middle of a very cold December night, we don't fly with doors um, either. Uh, it was, you know, we got to watch um, Air Force One come into sight under our night vision goggles. And it was an incredible honor to be selected for that mission. Um, it was an incredible way to close out um, one of my final missions in Afghanistan and really um, in the Army as well. So my journey as a small town farm girl to flying multi-million dollar helicopters in combat and leading missions was absolutely anything but easy. But it was an absolutely incredible ride. I made some incredible friends. I unfortunately lost some due to the realities of war. I'd witnessed terrorists, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda. I'd been shot at too many times to count, too many firefights to count, and had some extremely close calls. My Kiowa got shot up in the same area of operation where the then leader of Al-Qaeda, Zarqawi, was killed by a US airstrike in 2006. I spent some time in some of the most notorious valleys that were witness to some extreme and very heroic combat where many brave soldiers earned medals of honor, earned a medal of honor. Those experiences in the military have had a lasting effect on my life. Years later, I was faced with a significant crossroads. What was I going to do when I left the military? I had two paths. I could either take the easy route. Um, I could continue to do what I had become good at, what I knew. Um, I could go on to work as a helicopter pilot. Or I could do something completely different and further my education and go to grad school. Flying was what I knew. It's what I thrived at. Um, it's where I felt comfortable and at home. Grad school actually terrified me. <laughs> I was always told myself I was a terrible writer. I always saw myself as more of the math and science type. And I knew grad school would be two straight years of writing, and that sounded like torture to me. But I had learned to love a challenge. After years of flying in combat, I had almost gotten comfortable with being uncomfortable. Later, I discovered that I was both right and wrong. I did go to grad school, and I did write for two straight years. But what I was wrong was that I found out that I wasn't a horrible writer. I was just intimidated by it. Somewhere along my path, I'd gotten it in my head that I couldn't write, and I let that misperception become my reality. Those two years of writing helped me realize that I didn't hate it. I actually loved it, and I had a passion for it. All of those writing, all of those years of writing led to me publishing articles, which led to analysis and commentary and then writing my book, Danger Close. So I went from thinking I couldn't successfully write an undergrad paper to save my life to being a published author for one of the biggest publishing houses in the world. The road less traveled is not an easy one, and it's definitely not for the faint of heart. You're gonna hit roadblocks, you're gonna hit potholes, you're gonna have people that try to run you off the road probably consistently. But I will tell you that if you make the decision to take some risk and go that route and stick with it through those hard times that you will face, you will learn exactly what you are capable of and you will learn that that is more than you likely have ever imagined. I'm gonna leave it with that. If anybody has any questions for me, I would be happy to answer some questions. So ladies and gentlemen, what, I know you have questions. What we'd like you to do is to come to a microphone on either side of the aisle so that we can all hear your great questions. Please. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I, my name is Alejandro Johnson. I just wanted to ask, how did you deal with the fear, like, of 
doing these things. It just seems so terrifying, like even listening to you. It was just it's hard. They were hard. There was like, like many aspects of the military are incredibly challenging. Um, but in my mind, I knew I was never going to la allow a single event to ever prevent me from not moving forward, no matter what it was. Repelling, um, getting strapped to a helicopter and you know pulled halfway up a building, getting dropped into water that flips upside down with completely blacked out. That was not fun at all. Um, but I knew it was a step to move forward towards my goal. And uh, I just told myself that it didn't matter if I was scared. It did not matter. I either had to figure out a way to push through that um, and move on to the next step, um, or I was going to be done. And I didn't want to be done. I wanted to prove to myself that um, what my goals that I was looking to pursue, um, that I was able to get there. And I was willing to work extremely hard to get there. So like I said, it was almost a conversation I had with myself where there was lots of scary times or being fearful of failure. You have to find a way to help it work for you versus against you. Fear is a good thing. It gives you the kick sometimes that you need um, to focus and figure out what you personally need to move forward. Um, but it also, if, if you let it grow too big, if you let it control you in a sense, it's gonna hurt you. So you gotta stop it before it gets to that point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Evening, ma'am. My question is, when you were in your moments of doubt and just feeling terrible, like you made a big mistake or a stupid mistake, and you looked at that picture, uh, was that the only thing that kept you going? Just that thought of in that picture of never giving up? Or was there something, someone, or a certain goal, something else that motivated you to keep going in addition to that picture? So what I've learned about doubt and never giving up is it's usually a um, perspective problem. So you're focusing on maybe things that you can't control or the negative um, or things in the past or how it affected you for how you're feeling right now in the moment. Um, so me having that photo was it like a reset for me. It allowed me to see that and reset my priorities and be like, all right, I'm about to walk out the door on a mission. Like, we don't have time for me to have my head somewhere else, to be thinking about how hard yesterday was or how unfair my circumstances were in whatever. It was, now it's go time and you're gonna focus. And um, not dwelling on the negative. That doesn't really hurt anybody but yourself. So seeing that photo for me was what helped me in those very hard times when maybe I did feel that way. And I said, all right, I need to regroup. I need to um, get my head on straight so I can be that effective member of the team that I had worked very hard to be accepted as. And if I made like a second part to that question, when you did make mistakes, like you said, like you don't dwell in the past, but how would you, I guess, think of how to fix that mistake or how to do better next time? Yeah, I don't, I think that everybody fails. Everybody makes big, small failures and failures are good. If you never failed, you would never be able to learn and grow from your mistakes. Um, and you would never progress as a person. There would be no personal growth because you have no motivation to change if you have, have never experienced adversity. Um, so I, I would say that using the times that you fail or the hard times, accept it. Accept that you could have done something better. You could have um, made changes that you didn't but now you have the opportunity to do so. And it may be hard, and in terms of like a literal situation, like give yourself a certain amount of time, honestly, to dwell on it. And then that's it. 
and then you move on and you're done with it. You're not feeling sorry for yourself anymore. You're not beating yourself up anymore. You're moving forward. So you gave yourself that 12 hours, that 24 hours for you to dwell on whatever happened. And then you say, all right, now if I dwell any longer, I'm hurting myself. I'm not growing, I'm not learning. And then make those changes and, and move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, like, what interested you in, like, going into the military and flying, like, big helicopters and stuff like that? I had a unique upbringing, I think, in terms of my exposure to aviation, and <clears throat> it was very, aviation was very normal in my household. It was just what we talked about. Like, my dad was very into civilian aviation. He was an um, airline pilot as well, and then once he was done flying for the airlines, he flew a uh, civilian. He, like, his dream was to build this grass airstrip um, and would fly his small plane off of that. And we loved air shows, but I also grew up in a very patriotic family where we would go to air shows and see people in uniform, and I was, I admired them. I thought that was absolutely amazing to see people who were serving. And that's why when 9-11 happened, I kind of felt like it was my love of country, my love of aviation, and I felt like the time was now for me to really do something. The military, like growing up, was always something where I was like, yeah, that'd be cool someday if I did that. Um, and then after 9-11 happened, I was like, no, I don't want to say it's someday it would be cool if I did that. I was like, this is what I want to go do now. Thank you. Thank you. Who are the type of leaders that you wanted to be like? Who are the type of leaders that I wanted to be like? Uh, there was a female in my unit. Um, she was probably the most incredible, toughest, like incredible warrant officer pilot that I have ever come in contact with. Um, and she was definitely a motivating factor and set an example for how I wanted to be. I saw how she, inter she was two ranks higher than me, so we were not like on a level playing field at all when I got there, um, but she was definitely someone that I admired and I looked up to, and I saw the respect that she, um, like other people respected her, um, and she'd worked for it. And I knew someday I wanted to get to that level and um, to be sort of accepted the way that she was, um, but it was not given to her. She uh, was a um, TAC leader at Warren Officer Candidate School, and so <laughs> she was very, very tough. It was kind of like a drill instructor, or a, um, a, but for, for uh, Warren Officer Candidate School. So it was, a lot of people were like very scared and intimidated by her. But I thought she was a great example for me as a young female coming into a unit um, with really no other um, people to look up to. Um, but she was a great role model for me. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, Cadet Peterson. Um, so for some of the cadets that are hoping to uh, branch aviation in the Army, what are some things that you wish you had known before going in that you learned pretty quickly once you uh, joined aviation? I would say learn the airframes. Don't just, am I still like, I would say don't just learn the uh, airframes themselves, but learn the missions. Um, and then flight school is competitive in terms of what type of aircraft um, you end up being selected for. Um, in my day, there were many different factors that went into the OML and how it was weighed when it came time to select an aircraft. Um, a lot of it had to do with physical fitness and your scores there. Uh, and studying, being the absolute best at every single check ride that you could be. Um, and being very well-rounded, I would say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, good evening, ma'am. I'm Cadet Walkup. Um, thank you for sharing your story tonight. I'm going to flight school here. 
late summer, so Congratulations. I found it really motivating. Um, the question I have for you is, how do you balance um, ambition and your hunger to be successful with humility? Because ever since, you know, they announced our branches, I'm trying to make, make sure my head isn't too big. So how do I make sure I stay humble while uh, maintaining my ambition? I would say don't waste your time dreaming. You already got what you wanted, and now find ways to get ahead. Um, if that's reading, leadership, um, physical fitness, whatever you can do to spend your time to bettering yourself once you get there, because that's gonna go out the window. Like, everybody's gonna be in the exact same, and there's gonna be very competitive people there. And um, so, yeah, it's just like that in-between time right now. And I would say use it to your advantage. Like, be, uh, do some reading, do some research. Um, so, so you're ahead of the game when you get there. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Thank Hi. you for coming out. Um, I just was wondering, as someone in a really unique position, what was your most valuable takeaway from the experiences you had? And if you could tell yourself, like your 22-year-old self, something now, looking back on all the experiences you've had, what would you say? Uh, so, in a weird way, I knew the path that I was pursuing was not going to be a cakewalk. Um, I don't think I knew the challenges, though, that I would face. And so I would say to, I would say develop some very thick skin early on. And don't allow other people's actions or perceptions to affect you and your goals. Because everybody's going to have an opinion. Everybody. And that shouldn't matter to you. Because what other people think about you is not your problem. So you're there for a reason. Work hard, study hard, be the best version of what you're trying to be. And don't let the noise affect you and your progress. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Hello. Um, when you were overseas, were there any like specific moments that like allowed for like the most self growth? Or any like moments specifically? I mean, in terms of like a war fighter combat type thing, I will say that when I went to Iraq for the first time, um, like I said, I was 23 years old. I was had significant responsibilities and I didn't know what to expect. You know, you can read the war books, you can read other, but other people's stories about how you're gonna react or what it's gonna be like when the bullets start flying and nobody knows until they go and experience it for themselves. And so I would say the first instant of that happening to me and my response gave me, because I didn't know how I really, like in my head, I was like, this is how it's going to be, but I had no idea until it happened to me. And so once it does, I think it gives you um, the confidence to have that experience underneath you of how you are going to respond under pressure and, and how you are going to act. And um, your training is so valuable in that aspect of how you are going to respond and react um, when things get crazy, which they will and they do. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, ma'am. So recently I finished my senior capstone and kind of focused on identifying why females still represent such a low number in aviation today. So my question is for you, looking back on your experience in the Army, how important is female exposure, or essentially seeing somebody that looks like you uh, in your career field or in aviation in general? 
You, your capstone was on what? I feel like it... it kind of just like identifying why, I guess, like female aviators are still such like a low, low percentage overall in uh, aviation. So my stance on this is a little different than what you hear today. Uh, I think that um, you need people there who want to be there. Um, and you need people who are going to work extremely hard and they have that, that drive that is necessary to be good in that field. Um, so I am all for recruiting to anybody and everybody, um, but I think people should have to want to be there um, and, and do everything to get there um, based on certain standards. Yeah. And then just to follow on too, so like, I guess for like, just kind of like seeing people that look like you in that career field, did you find like at all, I guess, any time in the army, like maybe finding a mentor or did that like impact do I all? Do I think that um, it would have changed things if I saw more people that looked like me? Yeah, like do you think like, I don't know, like exposure, uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I have... I don't know if it would have um, been different. Like I said, that, that female mentor that I had, she was not any easier on me than anybody else. She was probably harder on me, actually, than anybody else. Um, because in all honesty, she didn't want me as a young female coming in and making her look bad. In fact, she definitely told me that. Um, and so, so no, I don't think it's necessary to have people that look exactly like you because ultimately that doesn't matter in combat. That doesn't matter to accomplish the mission. What matters is that you guys are there for a common purpose and that is to serve your country and defend our nation. And when you guys get to whatever team that you are in, all of that goes out the window how you grew up, your experiences, all of that. It is how can you contribute and make the person to your left and your right know that they can trust you when people are getting shots, when you are in the hardest circumstances of life, that people need to be able to count and trust on you regardless of things that have occurred in the past. Um, and the best way to do that is to earn each other's trust through a unified goal, which is the mission that you're tasked with in whatever unit you end up in. So I'm a very big mission first person. If it helps contribute to the mission and accomplishing that mission, then that is the right path. And that's what's ultimately going to lead to success. But for my individual experiences, um, I don't know, there was like very few other people that looked like me, so yeah. Thank you. Sure. Good evening, Mel. I'm Cadet Johnson, class of 24. First and foremost, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you. And so as you just said, your mission first, but well, my question for you is like, do you feel like you ever had to deviate from, mission, from a mission because it compromised your character? Or your morals? Uh, no, I, I was not faced with that. Uh, you're faced with very hard decisions, um, but I think that it was a very common mentality that um, you know you had your left and right limits, and and you understood rules of engagement and um, what you were there to do. Um, so when I joined the military, I feel like I did so with my eyes open and knew what would be accepted or um, expected of me. So I, I never found myself in that situation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Taylor, you get the last question. Yes, sir. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Kate Taylor. I want to commend you for everything you've discussed today, and thank you again for your service. Thank you. My question applies more so to the current social unrest in regards to the place of women in modern society as it stands very currently. 
you mentioned you were the commander of an aircraft and that is rooted in control. You were in control in that sense. And so I ask you as the world around us, specifically for women changes, continues to change, the conversation changes, our role in society changes, how do, you, how do you advise that we use our voice to be comfortable where we don't have control or where we have control? How would you navigate that, where you found yourself very much in control? And I feel like maybe for myself at times, I feel like I'm not in control in the narrative that I have in modern society as a woman. And I'm not sure, I'd look to you for advice and how you might navigate that, if that made sense at all. So I would say if you are focused, on changing people's perceptions, the best way that you can do that is to be so good at your job that anything else that they talk about is surface level and it doesn't matter because be so good at your job that they can't use that against you. Understood, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you all very much. For coming and speaking to our cadets and our staff and faculty tonight. Uh, you, your story certainly exemplifies our theme this year, which is courage of convictions, and a lot of that courage showed up. But our courage really showed up in the insight about in combat, being part of a team is everything. So I am privileged to have had Miss Amber Smith, Chief Smith, be part of my task force in Iraq and to fly several missions as my wingman on missions to keep Bastogne soldiers of the 1st Brigade, 101st, safe and to do uh, many, many things in combat from finding IEDs, from taking out bad guys to getting uh, us safely on several air assaults. So first and foremost, I want to thank you for your courage and your service as part of Task Force uh, 217 CAB out front, Air CAB. On behalf of our Corps of Cadets, Superintendent, and our staff and faculty, thank you very much for coming tonight and sharing your great Thank you so much for having me.